I'm your host, Micah Versman, and this is The Producer Podcast. Today we are joined by Aaron Burns. Aaron has worked on a number of film projects over the years, including Beyond the Mask, Overcomer, and the miniseries Washington's Armor. Today we're excited to talk to him about producing period films, so without further ado, let's get started. Thank you for coming on the show today, Aaron. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So I always love hearing uh, not only how people got started in film, but especially from producers, how did they end up pursuing this role of being a producer? So maybe to start, just kind of tell us a little bit of your background and how you came to be in the producer field. Sure. Well, like a lot of people who are in film today, I started off making movies in my backyard with my cousins and my friends. Um, We had grew up with some woods and some land behind our house. So I always have used to tease my dad that his greatest mistake was when he loaned us the chainsaw. And we went in the woods and we cut down a bunch of trees and built this log cabin. So of course we got to make a pioneer, you know, Cowboys and Indians movie now. So we were running around. Yeah, we start off with the giant on your shoulder VHS cameras and then graduated to the little mini DV cameras that you could actually edit on a computer and those kind of things. Um, and just had a lot of fun. Originally, it wasn't as much about making movies as it was about telling stories and acting them out ourselves. So we were most of the time playing the main characters and making our own costumes and just kind of having fun. And eventually we decided to make a feature film. We said, hey, wouldn't it be cool? It's just when I was finishing high school, heading off to college. We said, wouldn't it be fun to make a full-on feature film? And we were going to do it for a couple thousand dollars and get it done in two years. And that wound up taking four years and like $80,000 that we spent all our college savings on and begged and borrowed money from everybody. And that turned into a movie called Pendragon, um, which even at that time, it wasn't necessarily for me something I was planning on doing as a career but something that was a hobby and a passion for storytelling. My dad would tell us stories every night and my mom gave us good books to read. Uh, And so just had a passion for those things. And it wasn't until after that film came out and then later on in college that I really got a burden um, to do filmmaking as a vocation. And then what, how did that uh, passion for film transition to the producers, the, the role? that you want to fill on sets. Absolutely, so I think I love, uh, so I've done acting. I used to act in our our movies more out of necessity because you couldn't find anybody (laughs) who'd be willing to come out week after week after week uh, because you can only shoot, you know, on the weekends when you're doing it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. But I love uh, music. I studied music in college and I thought I might be a composer, but I found myself uh, in the basement 12 hours a day, you know, in my little sound studio working on composing. And I was just getting sad and depressed. I was like, what's wrong with me? And it's like, I love people too much to be, to be locked in a room by myself. So some of the things I enjoy about producing is I love seeing the vision for a project. And as the producer, you have the privilege of saying, wouldn't it be cool if, and you start with an idea, wouldn't it be cool if we could tell a story about this or if we could, um, to highlight this aspect of what, what do we want to do with the story? Who's the audience? Uh, what should the budget be? Where should we film it? All that imagining and dreaming that starts at the very beginning, you get to do as a producer. And then you get to see the project all the way through to completion. So I get the great privilege of working um, in partnership with writers, directors, actors, you know, all the way through our editors and, and post and on into the marketing and distribution. So I get to get as the one who's entrusted to hold the project mm-hmm. from that. Wouldn't it be cool if idea all the way until you're seeing it uh, in your home on a DVD or in a theater. So uh, I think I have definitely kind of two sides to my brain. One's the storytelling side, but the other is the people side and the logistics side. And I okay. love things together and, and setting up super talented artists to be a part of telling a story and, and seeing that team grow and, and kind of leading the people through the project is some elements that I really enjoy about. It. Nice. 
voice. When you as a producer, you know, you're getting ready to start a project and the director's first coming on, what are some questions that you're maybe asking so that you're making sure your vision and the director's vision are lining up? Well, first of all, plenty of, if you have it, plenty of time uh, in development and prep. Those are the two, development and prep are the two cheapest areas to spend time because your team is so small. So never rush through those phases of the project. Uh, on a feature film, it might be a two year journey and you're only on set for six weeks, but you have you know years potentially in development and then months in pre-production. So make sure you set aside time and just spend talking and dreaming and planning uh, and, and asking all those what if questions together. So before you ever get started with making the movie, um, you have to figure out what you want to make. So over time, the philosophy that I've developed is there's three equal phases to doing any project. It's figuring out what to do, figuring out how to do it, and then actually doing it. And often our temptation as producers is to rush right into the doing it phase. And mm -hmm. you, you fail to fully execute on the figure out what to do and how to do it. So when you're first stepping into a project with a director, having plenty of time to talk and listen to what their vision is um, and what your vision is and, and to get into both theoretical and specifics. Because sometimes you can create an argument, a theoretical argument that uh, that scenario is never even going to happen in the script of the project. So let's talk, you know, big picture vision goals um, and then let's get into the specifics. So hitting it on both those levels. And what I love to do is create a document that's called why I'm excited about blank and you put the name. Your okay. Partner. And so this document, when you're in development, you say, this is, this is when I had that idea. Wouldn't it be cool if we did this project, we, did, we told this story, we, we reached this audience. The wouldn't it, um, the why I'm excited about blank document doesn't say anything about the kind of scenes that will have to be in there, the exact dialogue or the budget or any of those things. But it's, these are my passion points. These are the reason why I'm willing to dump two years of my life into this or five years of my life into this. Because this is what I want the outcomes to be. And then we'll talk about that, that document. And sometimes, in some cases, another team uh, brings it to me if it's not the part that, that I originated to say, this is our project, would you produce it for us? I always sit down and try to pull out of them the why am I excited about this movie? And that mm -hmm. because you can always look back and maybe there's things that changed along the way. Uh, okay. and maybe it's your favorite scene. But as long as you, as long as the end products matches that original vision, that original dream, then we're doing okay. So those are the, the kind of things that, that I'd like to, like to talk about, I guess, and say as you, as you onboard. And then that builds a great foundation. So when the director's um, not there, and I'm talking with the artist, uh, you know, I'm talking to the 3D guys, we're talking about all these different things. You can say, no, you know what, let's make that compromise. Well, I'm okay with those three compromises to save money, but this one we're gonna need to fight for. Mm -hmm. And it can really help us uh, focus our energy and focus our conversation uh, and focus our budget because you always have limited resources. And if you know exactly what the main goals you're trying to achieve are, you can hold those other things loosely and focus on the big picture goals. I wanted, because you've worked on a number of period and historical film projects, both with uh, Burns Family Studios and then with other people. So I wanted to look a little bit at that. So I guess first, what got you interested in producing films that have this historical setting and not just your everyday drama? Uh, it's definitely my mom's fault. Um, <laughs> As, as kids, she was constantly feeding me great adventure stories and, you know, books uh, from history and historical fiction and, and biographies and these things. And I just love, um, I love adventure and I love going to a different world where almost nothing is the same, but then okay. at the same time, everything is the same because we're all humans and we all live in the same world. So when you can go to a different time and a different place, and you can strip away a lot of the, the modern stereotypes, the modern things that we would, um, would, could be filters between you and the story, you can really connect with the audience and you can really connect with these characters in a way that might be even more challenging if it was a modern day story. 
Um, so that's one of them. The other, the other piece is the ability to just transport you and, and be entertaining and be fun, uh, to take you to on an adventure that you could never go on if you weren't reading the book or watching the movie. Uh, and I just, I love taking audiences there because I love to go there. I loved, as a kid, dressing up and playing adventures outside. So it's the little 12 year old boy who's still alive in me that wants to make these movies for my kids. And so as I, I have a seven and five year old boys and then a 18 month and two month year old daughter. So I've got these four little kids and my boys are just starting to, to enjoy all those things as well. So I wanna make movies that they can watch and they can enjoy and be inspired by in their faith, in their, their manliness, in their courage, all those kind of things. So that's what is, uh, that's what is exciting about it to me. As a producer, when you're working on those historically set projects, is there like additional research you're usually doing? Yes, and I'll say the first, the first movies that we did, um, if you go back, you can watch Pendragon on Christian Cinema now. Um, it's not a great movie <laughs> in any stretch of the imagination. I play the lead actor. Um, you know, we have, uh, and I'm you know, not an actor. It was almost entirely volunteer production. But it was, it's very exciting, it's very fun, and it's, it was, uh, it's a very inspirational story. And we went back to the, the era of King Arthur. Okay. A story about um, God's calling on our lives and what God calls us to do, he gives us the grace to accomplish. And so we did a fair bit of historical research, um, but also we just made a lot of stuff up because we couldn't afford to do it 100% accurately, right? As your skill increases, as your level of experience increases, and as your, as your resources increase, you're able to do better and better and better with historical accuracy and with, you know, with, with the elements of, of controlling those things. So doing the research uh, is, is so much fun. And sometimes you'll find out these things that uh, totally you would never have expected. So with the Beyond the Mask movie, that's one that was our second big period adventure film we were able to do a lot more. Um, now, now, this one is very much historical fiction. So we, we there's okay. some um, elements uh, in Beyond the Mask, set in 1775 and 1776. But it was all based in the reality of the time period. So we studied what was going on with electricity at the time. And there was Ben Franklin, you know, everyone knows his kite experiments, and he created this little generator. But there was a giant electrostatic generator that was, that was created in Europe. And you can go see it in this museum, this huge generator. Um, there's another fun historical fact that we discovered in the harbor of Philadelphia, um, there was this uh, sunken ship that formed okay. these, all this silt then like built up on the side of the sunken ship. And there's this little island here. Eventually they built a windmill there that was abandoned and then it got dredged up by the military uh, in later years. And then there was this assassination attempt on the life of George Washington right in the same weeks leading up to the Declaration of Independence by this guy who worked for the East India Company. And all these, um, all these different connections and these plots and these things. So we said, uh, wouldn't it be fun if we took the historical reality of the day, but then we pulled all these other additional threads uh, and wove through it uh, and, and created a fictitious story in that context, in that setting. So that's a really, really fun way to approach it. Uh, there's another, there's a film that I'm developing right now about the life of a, of a missionary named Hudson Taylor, who okay. went uh, to China in the 1850s and 60s uh, to share the love of God with the people there. And that one is a biopic about a person that we have a ton of information about. So um, one of his great, 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 great grandsons is, is uh, involved in the project and he owns the family Bible and he can open it up and say, you know, find writing about passages and things that you have access to. And then he, you know, Hudson Taylor published many books and journals and letters. So with that one, it's not as much picking little pieces and drawing a story together. It's you've got a massive canvas with way too many stories to tell. And it's about narrowing and selecting your theme and your focus. And what, what, what version of the story do you want to tell? What things do you want to draw out in that? So that's been a very uh, rewarding experience. Uh, and we're almost finished up with that script. So. Uh, yeah, depends on what your goals are, but plenty of research to go either way. And then that's just with the characters, creating the world. Like our art department has an absolute blast diving, uh, you know, those, those elements. So we had several uh, historians uh, and several cultural experts 
uh, and then several uh, artists working to put together what we call our art and style guide for the Hudson Taylor project. So we just did the first pass of that. Okay. Uh, that sounds like a neat uh, project that I'll have to keep an eye out uh, for yeah. as it moves yeah. forward. Yeah, it's, it'll, it'll be fun to see uh, when that one comes to, uh, comes to production. We'd hopefully shoot it, um, but with right now, there's COVID all over the world. So uh, mm -hmm. now we're still in, in fundraising stage, um, but uh, would love to shoot it in East Asia. And we've okay. been planning and scouting and things over there to make that film as authentic as possible. Yeah, that would that'd definitely be a fun project. With period films, obviously there's a lot more to them. So that's going to really change and grow your budget. So do you have any tips for people that are maybe looking to produce their first period project on like how to build an accurate budget for something like this? So the problem is when you give advice and you don't take your own advice, that's where you run into trouble. So the, the advice that I should that I should give and I should take is um, movie making, filmmaking is almost impossible. Like movies don't want to get made. Nobody wants to help you make your movie. Nobody cares uh, when, you're, when you're starting out. And it's just this massive, uh, it's, it's crushing amounts of work and pain and blood, toil, tears and sweat that have to go into these film productions. So when you add a layer like, let's make it a period piece on top of the challenge of just making a feature film in the first place it has the potential to be absolutely overwhelming. So my first piece of advice is just don't. Just don't do it. Uh, save yourself so much time and, and heartache. But I would say if you're led to and you're called to tell those stories um, and you, you have that passion, you can't, uh, you can't shake it and you, you have that sense of calling towards that direction, then um, you're crossing into a new threshold and figuring out how to tell those stories. So, with that caveat, um, some of the same typical budgeting rules apply for uh, period pieces as they do for features, that the biggest drivers are the number of locations, the number of sets, uh, the number of actors, uh, the number of, um, you know, then stunts and explosions and those extra pieces. Now, the problem is with a feature film, you typically are going to have a lot, or a, a period feature film, typically going to have a lot of those things. But if you look at your scripts, um, you can tell a Civil War story that we're going to do, you know, the Battle of Gettysburg, and it's going to be the whole nine yards, and you're going to, it's going to be, you know, these three-hour epics. Or you could tell a movie set in the Civil War that's about a person who's, you know, wounded in their tent, right? And it's there, it's this interaction between these two brothers, and it's this intimate story that's set in that era, but you're largely staying in and around one camp and one woods and it's a skirmishing, you know, you have some little battles and things, but it's like a couple of guys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your scale is certainly a, a big part of it, of, of what you're doing. How many locations, how many actors, how many extras? Because remember, it's exponential. When you're shooting a film like War Room and we have our jump rope sequence at the end, well, yeah. we can call the National Association of Jump Ropers and, uh, and they come out and they help us train our teams and we get local kids from the area and we get local churches come together and people just wear their clothes that they've got on and have the hairdos and the shoes they have on and they show up and we film our jump rope scene. But when you're shooting a period film, every single thing you see on screen has to be manufactured except for rocks and trees. So most, <clears throat> even historical locations, if you can find one that's willing to let you shoot there, uh, there's so many restrictions around, oh, this is roped off and you can't do this. And you have to just be really, really careful with how you're using them. So you're either working, you know, with a very expensive historic location or you're building one from scratch. And we've done, mm -hmm. you know, a full. Uh, so just keeping in mind those things that the more you try to do, uh, the more it's going to cost. So make sure that you invest your resources in the right spots. Okay. Back to what we talked about at the beginning of knowing exactly what your vision is and what you're trying to pull off. So as an example with Beyond the Mask, we really wanted to deliver an action adventure film that, that families would walk away feeling like they got to go on a wild ride and just had a lot of fun. Uh, while at the same time, learning the themes 
of identity um, and justification and what does it take to get me out to, to make me okay and so exploring those biblical themes uh, and those gospel themes in the context of an adventure story is what we wanted to do to reach a, a younger audience we said okay we can't just have non-stop action the whole movie like we might like to so how do you frame it what are you going to do so what we what we said is our biggest three set pieces you have one in the beginning one in the middle and one at the end okay so the movie opens off with a big bang there's this huge raid on this ship uh and you've got you know this this ship sailing down the um, the Thames River, and you've got these guys zip lining, you know, and this just fun attack. And we built the back of a ship, we built this tower, and in massive CG efforts to go into this big bombastic opening. Um, and then, uh, you know, the movie takes off. We have a few action scenes throughout, but then the next big visual effects heavy set piece is what we call the rooftop chase, and that's kind of the promise, the premise of this hero who embraces uh, his Zorro kind of calling, right, to, to go in and rescue and, and attack and do all these things. And it's, again, a massive spectacle of, uh, you know, for our tiny budget, a big spectacle piece of tons of visual effects. And then you get to the end and you have the whole final sequence. So when people uh, open the movie, they get this big blast in the middle of the movie, uh, they're reminded that they're watching a big adventure film. And then right at the end, they walk into the theaters having gone on this fun ride. So thinking strategically, whatever scale your budget is, whatever scale your project is, of being careful where you spend and, and cut corners where the audience doesn't care. There's some scenes where literally you can have two guys in a tent talking, it gets done what it is and you add some sound effects in the background, you communicated your message. You don't need to have them talking, you know, the whole army training behind them. Just put them in their tent and put the sounds of an army behind them. Bam, I just saved you $150,000. So, um, those kind of uh, strategic thinking about where does it matter, what are you trying to get, uh, can be helpful. Okay. You mentioned uh, you've done some filming like at historical locations. Uh, so what was that like, I guess, getting, getting the permission, but then working uh, <laughs> through the process of production on those yes. locations? So let me tell you a story uh about an early failed attempt to do this we were we were kids trying to make a short film uh and it was me and my cousins my siblings and a couple of friends and here in michigan there's a place called henry ford museum in greenfield village and it's this if you ever come to michigan you gotta visit uh it's down in in dearborn this is amazing historical village and they've got all these cool houses and um, buildings and things that, that Henry Ford gathered from all over the world. Well, I guess pretty much all over America. So they've got like the Wright Brothers Bicycle Shop and they've got um, Thomas Edison's Lab and all these things together you can go see. So we were just kids trying to make a short film and we said, hey, you know, would it be okay if we came in and we filmed a bunch inside your buildings? And they're like, oh, I don't know. You know, so we said, well, we'll just show up anyway and just kind of see what happens. So we were all wearing our costumes. Uh, we hadn't fully locked in a green student or anything like this. Um, and my uncle, we, we dressed him all up as playing this bad guy. And so he's got this big black cowboy hat on, this kind of like trench coat -y looking thing. And he's got our home video tripod, right, for a little mini DV, DV camera under his arm. And one of the tripod legs is broken and it never quite, it never quite sticks. Uh, so, He's holding it and we're standing there in the, in the park and all of a sudden two like the park rangers or park directors come riding up to us on their bicycles. Uh, and just at that moment, a group of school children walk by. And you gotta remember my uncle's standing here, we're all got these goofy costumes on and he's got this black hat and this big tripod under his arm. And then choo, the leg of the tripod shoots out. So it all of a sudden it looks like he's holding this massive machine gun. And just as the park ranger folks are, are pulling up the kids to go, cool, what kind of gun is that? <laughs> and the park ranger's like, you know what? You just guys need to go. You can't film here. And we're like, oh, okay. So that was our, that was lesson number one about filming in historical locations. Um, make sure, you know, again, we were just kids trying to make a short film, but uh, make sure that you plan in advance and communicate, communicate, communicate exactly what you're trying to do. Walk them through the script. Uh, don't undersell, hey, it's just gonna be a couple people, no big deal. Start by sharing your vision with them. 
what, why do you want to make this movie? What is the benefit that will offer to that historical location? So most of these people who own these historical buildings really care about history and they want mm -hmm. to see these things used. So if, if your film is set in such a way that would highlight the value of their location and highlight that period of history, you'll find people who, are, who will warm to your idea. Um, so you, you talk and communicate your vision clearly first. Second, listen to their needs. Like what, are, what is important to you? What can we do or not do with fog machines or candles or extras or parking and, and, and really, really listen to what their needs are. Then go back and formulate your plan and your ask and don't undersell what you're trying to do. Don't say we're gonna have a couple people and, and a couple trucks. It's like, we've got four huge trucks. We're gonna have 150 people. We're gonna need crew parking. We're gonna need bathroom space. You know, but this is our plan to mitigate all of your concerns. We're going to lay down, you know, heavy paper. We're going to, we're going to bring in all this team that's going to control all these things. Um, and of course, you'll have production insurance in those pieces and, uh, you know, professional uh, people to handle the locations and, and make sure that they're, they're babysat through all of those things. And if you do that, uh, I've found that generally you're warmly accepted. Now you're on a thin, uh, you're on a thin edge because if you if things start to go sideways, you know you could get you could get kicked out. But um, that's never never happened to us because you keep an open and honest relationship with mm -hmm. them. So, for example, with Beyond the Mask, we filmed in quite a, a number of big historical mansions, um, and we were just very careful to clean up after ourselves. We had a fantastic locations team on that project, and the people had never let someone film at this mansion before. They had such a good time working with us, and they said, "Hey." maybe we should let other filmmakers come and shoot at this mansion. This was great. Um, and I, I talked to the location uh, owner a year or so after we wrapped a project. He said, yeah, after you guys left, we've had another project come through here. And without telling us about it, I pulled up on one of the mornings of the shoot and there was a tank driving around on the lawn firing blank rounds. And in the sanctuary of their, the chapel area of their, of their, um, their mansion, there was smoke grenades blowing off and people running around doing all these things. There was no communication, no plan, no advance warning. Uh, wow. Terrified. So uh, if you do it right and you're, you're very careful and respectful, you can pull those things, you, you know, you can have a good relationship and leave a good taste in their mouth and, and leave it open for other filmmakers to do, but don't be like the, the tank driving guys uh, blowing off smoke grenades in your sanctuary. Uh, one other thing uh, that I would say is often historical locations are so limited in what you're able to do that you're better off just building one. Okay. So if you're trying to work on a log cabin or you're trying, you know, and you, oh, let's go use Abe Lincoln's log cabin. Just forget it because that is too precious of a place for you to be bringing all your gear and opening your, like you need to really, when you're filming some of these things, you really need to use, it, especially if there's action sequences around where you're blowing stuff up or burning stuff down. They mm -hmm. just don't want their historical locations burned down. I don't know why. Um, but, if you can uh, strategically think about which ones should be built and which ones we can get away with filming at a real location. And if there's any kind of, in my experience, any kind of action or special effects or those things, you're often better off just building it. Okay. You know, trying to, to work with a, with a location because it'll be a disservice to them and you, you're, um, you'll be so restricted in what you can pull off. It'll be, could potentially wind up being a disservice to your film at the end of the day as well. That's some good thoughts. I've, I've yet to try doing anything, period. So I'm not brave enough. <laughs> <laughs> when you're making these uh, period films, just kind of looking briefly at the distribution side, uh, what do you have to do to make sure that, one, there is like a target audience for this film, and then to make sure you're actually going to be able to hit that target audience when the film releases? Man, distribution is always the challenge. But there's really, in my mind, there's, there's the three hardest parts of successfully completing a film project is getting a script perfect, then getting the, the, the funding package, uh, which mm -hmm. may cast and directors and those things to get, get the film off the ground, um, and then getting distribution and actually getting the project out there. The two sides of distribution, there's marketing and distribution. Distribution is getting the film in front of your audience. Marketing is getting the audience in front of your film. So being able to pull off the beginning, the end of the project, actually making the movie in the middle is not that hard. It's just, it's just a lot of work. But setting it up correctly 
uh, and, and getting the, the release done correctly. Uh, those are the, the real challenging parts. So a period film is, and from that perspective, is no different from any other film. It's knowing who okay. you are, knowing what they will care about, um, and making sure you deliver on those things. So something we discovered um, with our with our first film, Pendragon. Now again, this was back in two thousand eight that we released it. So this is like forever, forever, forever ago in terms of film time. And at that time, there were really no faith. There were very few faith based films, and there were no faith based adventure films out there. There just it wasn't really much of a thing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could, you know, say, well, the Chronicles of Narnia or something, but those are massive studio level projects. So something kind of in, in, in that niche market, there just wasn't anything there. So, and that film, we didn't have any big actors. We didn't have any big name, anything. But what we, we had was a, a fun story, an adventure story, and one that had um, faith and family values in it. Uh, and, it and a fun adventure that a family could watch and enjoy together. And for our audience, our, our niche little audience of families who wanted to, were interested in something like this, that's what they cared about. And if we put a massive actor in there and we spent all this money to do that, it wouldn't have mattered to them because our audience was mm -hmm. niche and focused and we were able to deliver something that they loved. So the 10 year old, you know, conservative family boy who watched Pendragon back in 2008, he loved it. It was great. I had this kid telling me my two favorite movies are Pendragon and Star Wars. He didn't care, right? Now, if I tried to target that movie to a different audience, they'd be like, this is horrible. Like this movie, is, the acting's bad, everything about it is bad because they didn't appreciate the things that were there to it. So that's a very focused case is the smaller your movie is, the smaller your budget is, the more focused you can be on your audience. Um, and really try to make sure that they love what you're delivering and it, it, um, it really serves them well. Now, as the, the movie gets bigger, you have to reach a wider and wider audience in order to, to, to pay back the investment that was made in the film. So that's something to think about, whatever your budget level is, know who your audience are and think about who's the first person who's gonna get in line uh, when they see this trailer release, they're gonna buy a ticket in advance to go see this movie. What, is that, who, what does that person talk about? What does that person like? What does that person engage with? What matters to them? And as you think about delivering on the things that matters to that person, you can create your fictitious audience member and have conversations with them about what you should put in the scenes, what you should put in the movie, how you should market and communicate it. Um, and from that perspective, a period film is really no different than, than any other film. All right. Yeah, no, that, that's good thoughts. Even just looking at the broader, whether you're marketing a period film or just your everyday drama, I think that's, that's some good thoughts. So I have some wrap up questions. I'll start. Uh, sure. Uh, asking, have you seen like any common mistakes that beginning producers seem to keep making as they're getting started? And what would you kind of like caution or what would be your advice to them to hopefully help others like avoid those mistakes? So common mistakes. I have made so many mistakes in filmmaking uh, that, and some of them I've some of them I've learned from, and some of them I've repeated again, and you have to do it a couple times before you can find what learned from them. But also I've learned from watching other people make mistakes as well. And those are, that's, that's the easier path to learning. So uh, a couple ideas that I would share for you. When you're first starting off, recognize that you don't know everything. You're still a learner. And I'm still a learner, even though I've been doing this for, you know, 14 years or something like that. I, I have so much to learn. Every day I'm learning new things because the industry is changing. So learning from others and being willing to listen to advice um, is a huge asset when you're, when you're beginning. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have a clear vision and you can't okay. know what you want to do and stick with what your plan is. This goes back to our earlier conversation, which is create your why I'm, why I'm excited about documents. And then when you're on set or you're in prep or you're talking to people, um, first share with them your vision and say, would you be willing to go on this journey with me and help me to achieve this vision and honor them by inviting them on that journey with you and say, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to need to, to learn from you and from others and be corrected in different areas, but we need, we're all working together on this vision. 
So then when someone comes to you and says, hey, here's a suggestion on a better way to practically do this. Be willing to listen to those things. Here's a suggestion, we could save money if we did this. And I've seen a lot of uh, young producers, and I'm including myself in that having made this mistake, and still hopefully being a young producer, uh, of, of not listening to people who have been there before. And sometimes you need to not listen. You need to say, no, 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 we're doing it this way because this is part of the vision, this is part of the calling. Mm -hmm. um, but other times, humble yourself and being will be willing to listen and take their advice. Something else that I would say, often when you're getting started, you're begging and borrowing favors from your friends and family. Um, and that is absolutely okay. That is not wrong. But what you need to do is value every contribution that's made. So if someone comes and donates a day of their time, you might not be able to pay them $300 for their day, but it was worth $300. And so you need to appreciate them and value them as if their time was worth that and as if you were paying them that. And I found that often the more I get paid, the more I'm appreciated and respected. The less I get paid, the less I'm appreciated and respected. And that just doesn't make any sense. You can always honor and respect and show gratitude uh, to people, um, no matter uh, whether you have a big budget to work with or not. So the way you treat people, the way you treat your crew, uh, the way you treat, you know, even if you're just a, you know, a young filmmaker working with your siblings, making movies, the way you treat all these folks, uh, to be respectful of them and appreciate everything that they bring to the table uh, is important. And a lesson that I've learned from not doing that uh, in the past. That's something that I, I try to think about uh, in the future. I like that. I definitely will write that down and plaster it on my wall. So another question I had, you know, you see people, they're like DPs and gaffers. They're always investing and showing off all the cool gear and tools that they get to own. So I'm, I'm curious, have you found, are there gear or tools that producers should be investing in? Mm. Uh, yes. There are two things, so not necessarily gear or tools, but the two things that you should be investing in are relationships and yourself. By investing in yourself, I mean that you should be constantly seeking to learn and constantly seeking to improve your craft uh, to grow in your emotional maturity, um, in your emotional intelligence, uh, to grow in your um, compassion, your ability to relate to others, um, to grow in your faith, uh, and, and all of those, those things that that means. Um, because as, as you grow as a leader, as a producer, as a leader, as a visionary, um, you'll be able to better serve the people around you. And learn your craft too. Study other films, break down their budgets, um, go to conferences, uh, read books, uh, do all of those things. And I have uh, another life philosophy that I've, I've learned is there's kind of three ways to learn. You learn by doing it, you learn by studying it, and you learn by mentorship or by watching other people do it. So you have to do all three. And the more okay. you do, the better, the better and better you can, you can become as you invest in, in uh, improving yourself. Um, so for a you know, very early stage filmmaker, you, I'm sure somebody in your family has a smartphone that has a camera on it. Just go shoot something. Just go shoot something and see what happens. And write a little script, plan it out and shoot something. And then take note of the things that went well, the things that didn't work well, why did it work, why didn't it work? And, and you, that's the doing it. Then go study it. Uh, read books on producing, watch YouTube videos on filmmaking. Uh, and, and repeat that process a couple times. And then look for opportunities to have the privilege of the, of the third one of watching others do it. And that could be by volunteering to help on a production to be a locations manager or to be an extra or to, to serve in some way um, for other film projects. And you know, as you demonstrate that you're willing to help and you're willing to serve, those opportunities will, will turn into something bigger and bigger. But bring your, bring your, your good attitude and your good work ethic and just be watching all the time. Why, I wonder why they made that decision. I wonder why they did that. I wonder why they chose to do it this way. I wonder why they spent so much money on that. Um, and you'll, you'll learn pretty quickly. So I had the chance to do all three of those things where we worked and worked and worked on our own stuff, um, studied, studied, studied. And then after we made a couple of films, got invited to come out and volunteer on other people's projects. And so I volunteered on a couple of projects 
and then wound up getting hired on other projects, and then went back and made our own movie. So kind of as you do those cycles, um, you'll be improving yourself. And I would also say, you know, life is about so much more than movies. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to be and have a community that's not just the filmmaking community. You need to be involved in a good church. You need to have good relationships with your family and find balance in all of the, the other life areas so that you, you can be a good filmmaker. Um, but that's not your core identity. That's not who any of us are is deep down inside as, as a filmmaker. And always remember that, that if your filmmaking fails, you are not a failure. Um, and that your identity can be found in who you were created to be, in, and that's a, a child of God. Um, so that's one thing that you can invest in as a, uh, now it's not gear, but that's, that's yourself, and not in a self-serving way, but you can better serve your teams. And the other huge one is, is relationships. Um, so I have many, many friends all over the country that I've worked with on projects. And you love to end a project um, where everyone makes it to the top of the mountain alive together, right? So, Yay, we're here. And you look back and there's dead bodies of all the people who you began with scattered down the mountain. Now, a few people die in every film production, not literally, but, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, safety is, is important. But there, there always is the potential for damaged relationships and disappointment and frustration and conflict and tension and those things. But as you work to, um, as, as you grow in your ability to listen and to problem solve and to plan and communicate um, and those things, you can, you can work to minimize those things and to build those relationships and be giving and investing in other people. Uh, and that will create opportunities for them to come back and help you when it's, when it's your turn. So um, those are two areas that I would say, yeah, we don't have toys and tools as producers, but you should have, um, hard, you know, budget and processing and planning, you know, technical skills, um, and then those relational skills and your own, your own wisdom and maturity. And then also the relationships that you have with other people, you can, you can be investing in them. All right. And then my final question is, especially, you know, this year's been crazy oh and, yeah. and stuff. So, what are ways that producers can be practicing and growing their skills when like this year, there's not a lot going on in the industry and you're not constantly finding projects to be working on? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, remember that a producer's job, a third of it is figuring out what to do. So okay. it's what to do and doing it. So development never stops. And so I, you know, in, in, in seasons like this, take a big opportunity to pause, to sit back, to pray and think and plan about what should be coming next and connect with, there's a lot of writers and a lot of people out there who are out of work right now, right? Who don't have anything going on potentially. So go and start, get some projects in development and start writing some scripts uh, and start making some plans and, and building connections and, and those kind of things for the future. So that's something you can always, always be doing. And also don't forget about animation. Um, animation, and, and, and those kind of things are something that's available no matter what. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see, because of COVID in the long term, you know, that taking an even, even bigger seat. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of opportunities to do uh, small things. Um, even like you're doing here, a podcast or an audio drama or finding, finding opportunities to take advantage of, of your space and your schedule to be creating and be telling stories. Um, there, there's plenty of them out there. And uh, we did a shoot during COVID. It was just, it was a, it was a smaller shoot, um, but I think this is officially, yeah, this is officially announced. So um, the movie Courageous, that came out 10 years ago, we had a, another feature film we were supposed to shoot with the Kendricks this past year, but weren't able to, to we just got COVIDized a number of different times with a number of different situations. But then uh, the idea was had what if we re-released Courageous next year with a shoot a new ending for it, redo the post, all those kind of things. So we were able to do a small shoot. It was just, you know, two days. Uh, we were able to pull off a shoot, um, thankfully during COVID, to shoot a new ending for the film. Um, and to, uh, to get that one, they'll be available to be released. So there's lots of other creative ideas like that that you could do with content that you already have, um, potentially, or... Uh, with, you know, smaller shoots that maybe you can't pull together 120 people to shoot a whole feature, but there are lots of things to do. So you're a producer, you're creative, figure out ways to stay busy. Um, and I will admit the, the pressure and the uncertainty and the grief and the sense of loss 
we've all experienced over the last couple of months, it really wears on you. So don't be afraid um, and intentionally take time to invest in your own um, spiritual health and you know time in the word and time uh, with your communities that are all broken up. It takes more effort to be involved in church and your family and those important things in seasons like this because we don't have access to the normal. So take the extra time and make sure you plan in that extra time because I know for me it's been a very uh, a year full of the potential for anxiety and uncertainty and all of those kind of things. So it's something that we've been really praying uh, and, and working on to, to keep an open hand and trust the Lord with that. And it hasn't been an easy one. It has not. So don't be afraid when you find yourself, you know, struggling with those things to take time and, and use the, um, the community that you have to find that encouragement. Um, and then turn on your creativity and see what you can do. I like that. So with that, we're going to wrap up this episode of the show. So thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Until next time, make sure to subscribe to the producer podcast and thanks for listening.